Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm not, I was not exactly sure of the nature of the audience, so it is possible that the talk is inadapted, of which uh, I, in that case, I apologize. Uh, what I would like to do today is to, to talk a little bit about the, the type of work that, uh, um, that I do and that we do in, uh, uh, among the people who work on the experimental approach in development economics. Today, uh, at least as of 2005, there were 1.4 billion poor people in the world, where poor is defined uh, below $1 a day per capita at PPP. Uh, 27 million children every year don't get the uh, essential immunization. Um, almost more than 6 million children die before their first birthday. Over 600,000 women die in childbirth. So when you hear these numbers, and in particular in the public uh, discourse when they surface, you have a bit of an oscillation between two positions. Either you throw up the fight in disgust, this is too big and you might as well think of something else, or you try to propose solutions that are going to solve the problem once and for all. It would be very nice to have a magic bullet so that problem is not with us anymore. What I'd like to propose today is uh, whether we can try and explore a third issue uh, that would both be relatively uh, um, gung-ho and willing to do something, but very modest and conscious of, of its limits. And that's what I've been calling the experimental approach and I'll describe in a, in a minute. So the, the discourse on aid and development and poverty er, uh, eradication it has a little bit of a tendency to become polarized or uh, caricaturized. So on the one hand, for example, we have Jeff Sachs, who promises the end of poverty by 2015, as long as we are willing to uh, spend, it as foreign aid, uh, $195 billion a year, which in a sense is not that much when you compare that, for example, to the stimulus package we are discussing today. It would be about a tripling of foreign aid. Um, according to him, the reason for the poverty of much of the poor world, in particular much of Africa, is mainly uh, uh, the climate, some poverty traps linked to disease, geography, and things like that. And it would, it would be possible to overcome them with targeted in interventions, and he knows what we should do. Against him, opposing him from the other side of New York, is uh, <laughs> uh, at NYU, Jeffrey Sachs is in the North, in Columbia University, uh, and at NYU is Billy Stolley, who is uh, contending that uh, foreign aid is useless or in fact worse than useless. Any positive effect that it might have is more than, uh, more than compensated by, the, by its bad effect on countries' governance. According to him, the only way to eradicate poverty is sustained growth, and of course, he doesn't claim in the first instance to have the secret of growth. He recognizes that growth rates are uh, erratic, they change. A country like India used to be the worst, and now it's a good country, and Brazil went the other way and then back again. So he understands that we don't understand what really is, explains growth. Uh, but he nevertheless has a solution inspired by Hayek or Friedman uh, his point is that free markets can eradicate poverty by making sure that seven billion experts, that, his, that it is its, uh, his, the sentence that he uses, can make sure that the best solution to eradicate poverty in their own country emerge. Uh, Jeff Sachs and Billy Stolley are not the only one to, pro to propose this like one-line solution, lots of money or lots of free market. Uh, those solutions are uh, frequently un encountered in the discourse of, if you want, the expert discourse on poverty that is also in the public domain at the same time. So we have, for example, Bjorn Longborg and the Copenhagen Consensus, who uh, brought a number of Nobel Prizes in, uh, in Copenhagen to try and list uh, the best way to spend $50 billion to make the world a better place. We have Paul Collier, who is focusing on uh, on failed states, and in particular, uh, has a very specific idea on how to combine aid with some form of uh, military removal. Uh, these people keep opposing each other, uh, and this, they both share the public space and uh, criticize each other, I think, uh, usually quite rightly. Uh, but they have, there is a common theme about these 
in all of these discourse. Uh, the first one is a discourse that, that claims to be scientifically legitimate. For example, I think it was very important for Bjorn Longborg to have his Nobel Prizes in Copenhagen. And at the same time, that uh, does not accept any complexity or simplicity. Uh, and it, it has to be very simple, and it has to give us a path. And I don't think this is uh, random. I, don't, I think there is a very natural tendency for the public discourse on an issue like world poverty to have these two characteristics. Number one is because the, the policy discourse does require a certain form of uh, uh, um, single-mindedness. For example, uh, Churchill was making fun of economists along saying, if I speak to four econ five economists, I obtain six answers, uh, five and then two from Keynes. At the same time, when we, so what he wanted is a, is a give me a one hundred, give me a one handed economist because he couldn't uh, take Keynes selling on the one hand, on the other hand. So at the other time, when you have a problem like, like poverty, which is both emotional, and at the same time, if we're talking about world poverty, it's something people are not very familiar with. So they want to be reassured by something which shows uh, uh, science behind it. So this discourse, there is a demand, I think, in the uh, policy discourse, for a policy discourse which is both full of legitimacy and at the same time without any doubt. But of course, it's a little bit dangerous to have a scientific discourse that doesn't accept doubt, because as we all know, there is almost no scientific discourse that, is, uh, that doesn't come without caveat. And in particular, the only way that you can really have one solution to eradicate poverty, either aid or non-aid or a market, is to, uh, the only way you can do that in the simplest way too, is to compare the the, the growth history of different countries in very simple cross-country growth regressions. So for example, uh, Jeff Sachs runs regression which shows that uh, countries with more malaria cases are poorer, or uh, uh, Willis, Billy Stolley runs regression which shows us a correlation, it's not even a regression, it's a, it's a re correlation between free market institution and, and poverty. And the problem, as all of you know here, is that in any cross-country data set, separating cause and effect is difficult, which is why you can have these endless debates in the, among these experts. To take an example on the malaria and poverty correlation, which has been quite active, is so Jeff Sachs tells us that malaria is correlated with poverty. That's, that's true. But then maybe countries which have poor institutions are not good at fighting malaria. And maybe that's the reason why uh, and maybe those poor institutions explain their poverty. To which Jeff Sachs replies that, oh, but poor institutions are themselves due to, uh, to poverty. So it is not uh, poor institutions that cause poverty, it's poverty that cause poor institutions, and uh, it's also malaria that cause poverty. So we're back full circle. So to get out of this full circle, the um, proposal, very ingenious proposal by Daron Asimoglu and co is to try and go back to history and use accidents of history, which explains, for example, in this case, why some countries have better institutions than others. So in their famous paper, they tell us that countries have better institutions when uh, they have set up settlement colonies as opposed to extraction colonies. And when did they do that? They did that when the first people who came to this country uh, didn't die in large numbers. But what did these people die of? They mainly died of malaria. So we are back full circle against with on the, this debate with Taran on the one side and Jeff Sachs on the other saying, well, this is institution that causes malaria, to summarize, or this is malaria that causes institution. And I think it's going to be very difficult to tease this apart. 